Welcome back to TFT Central. Today we're going to talk about the wide range of new 32 inch 4K 240Hz OLED monitors that are coming out this year, all of which were heavily promoted at this year's CES event in January and they're attracting a load of interest right now from the market. Only one of these monitors has been released so far and even then that's only in limited regions at the moment, with the other screens likely to be released in various phases throughout 2024. Today we wanted to run through the different options that are being released, provide a comparison on their features, specs and expected performance, and discuss the expected release dates to hopefully help you decide which is the right one for you and which you might wait for. All of these new 32 inch OLED monitors are built around just two competing panel options. So it's important first of all to understand which models are using which panel types. There's a Samsung Display QD OLED panel from their third generation, or there's an LG Display W OLED panel from their latest meta generation to choose from. And while some of the specs and performance areas will be similar, there are also a few differences you need to keep in mind. Both panels are accurately measured at 31.5 inches, but we'll call them 32 inches for now, with a 3840 by 2160 4K resolution and support for a 240Hz refresh rate. They both offer the near instant response times and per pixel level dimming thanks to their OLED panels, making them really well suited to gaming and HDR content. That's the simple part, but let's break down where the two are different. The Samsung Display QD OLED panels should be ready first, meaning that the screens based around this panel will be released to market first, as the panel itself went into mass production actually in December 2023. The Dell Alienware AW3225QF is the only monitor that's actually been released so far, available in North America already, but not in Europe at all yet. There have been other competing options announced already, including models from MSI, Asus, HP, Gigabyte and Samsung, they're all using the new Samsung QD OLED panel, and this was developed as part of their new third generation, made possible by their new Pico inkjet process. That was introduced in their third generation of QD OLED panels, allowing for that higher pixel density of 4K and the increase to 140 ppi. The panel is available in flat and curved formats, with Dell opting to use the curved version for their screen, but all the other manufacturers so far have only announced models with the flat version of the panel. The panel itself will feature the standard QD OLED coating, so that's considered semi-glossy, and it provides cleaner and clearer images than the competing W OLED panel from LG Display that we'll talk about in a moment. It does also have some reasonable reflection handling from the added AR film. That avoids the fairly grainy appearance of the W OLED panels, but it doesn't handle external lights or reflections as well. All of these new QD OLED models will have the same standard QD OLED coating, with the notable exception of Samsung Electronics, who have for some reason decided to add an additional matte anti-glare coating to their panel. Because of the lack of a polarizer on these QD OLED panels, they will all have the same challenge when it comes to ambient contrast and black depth, and how the panel handles your external lighting. We did an extensive study on this last year, which is linked in the description below, but basically, as ambient light increases, these QD OLED panels have raised blacks and don't retain their contrast as well as the competing W OLED monitors. On the other hand, the QD OLED panels do have a wider colour gamma, offering around an 86% REC 2020 coverage, compared with around 74% coverage on the LG Display W OLED panels. This provides better support for wider gamut content, including any content that's mastered in REC 2020, and it can also cover more of other professional spaces like Adobe RGB, which is commonly used in the professional and photography market. So if you need to do color critical work in those color spaces specifically, then those QD OLED panels will work a little bit better for you. The increased color gamut from the QD OLED panel can also lead to a higher perceived brightness of colors in practice, which is something we plan to explore a bit more in the near future. So do hit subscribe to stay up to date on that. Speaking of brightness, the QD OLED panels are quoted still with a peak brightness spec of 1000 nits for HDR while the new LG Display W OLED panels can reach up to 30% higher at 1300 nits. Although it does remain to be seen how each screen handles brightness for different APL window sizes, and what influence the increased colour gamut of the QD OLED panels will have on the perceived brightness in real use. LG Display's W OLED panel will be going into production later in the year than Samsung's panel, and that's currently expected around May-June time. 
As a result, there's fewer monitors announced so far with this panel, and those that have been unveiled will be released later in the year as a result. Probably around August, September, as we predict at the moment. And these may be worth hanging on to and waiting if the capabilities suit your needs more than the Samsung QD OLED panels. One of the key differences with the LG Display W OLED panels is that as well as supporting the 4K resolution and 240Hz refresh rate, it can also support a feature called DFR, which has allowed the monitor manufacturers to use what they are calling dual mode operation. You can choose to game at 4K 240Hz if you want to prioritize resolution, detail and picture quality, or you can also drop to a lower 1080p full HD resolution and bump the refresh rate up to 480Hz instead if you want to prioritize speed, frame rates and motion clarity. This could be useful if you're playing faster paced or competitive games and if you're more focused on driving the lower resolutions and higher refresh rates, that will offer you improved motion clarity and overall system latency as well for gaming. It's an interesting option for competitive gaming use cases. 1080p resolution should also be handled with pixel perfect integer scaling as well, which should help the image clarity even at this lower resolution. The LG Display WOLED panel will be available in a flat format only, and it has their standard matte anti-glare coating, which should be the same as that used on the current 27-inch and 45-inch OLED monitors that you can find in the market today. It is a bit more grainy in appearance than modern LCD monitors even, and can make the image look a little dirty and less clear as a result. It's not terrible or anything, but it doesn't look as clear and clean as the Samsung QD OLED panels can with their semi-glossy coating. We prefer the coating on QD OLED panels, to be honest, generally to the matte WLED panels. On the other hand, these LG Display WLED panels do handle ambient lighting better than QD OLED, largely avoiding the issues with raised blacks and reduced contrast that we talked about earlier. The coating also handles reflections better than the semi-glossy coating of QD OLED panels, so if you're using the screen in a well-lit room or your light sources are likely to cause reflection problems, then these panels are probably better suited. It's a little tricky to compare the text clarity between the new QD OLED panel and the W OLED panels at this stage, but we know that LG Display are moving to a brand new subpixel layout for their new 32 inch panel, moving away from the traditional RWBG layout used in their existing monitor panels like the 27 inch and 45 inch models, to a new RGWB layout. This is expected to improve the text clarity alongside the general improvements made thanks to the high resolution and increased pixel density. Although we'll need to wait and see, of course, how these screens compare with one another when we get to test them later in the year. We know that Samsung made some decent improvements with their second generation of QD OLED panels as well in 2023, updating their RGB triangular layout to have a more square-shaped subpixel layout with higher pixel fill. And this has been carried over to their third generation panels as well, which is great news. We'll of course try and compare them side by side later in the year when we have both panels available but our expectation right now is that the text rendering and clarity should be very similar on both options and should be very good now thanks to the new layouts and the higher pixel density. As we mentioned earlier, the WOLED panels have a smaller color gamut than the QD OLED panels, reaching around 74% Rec 2020 coverage. This is still fine, of course, for HDR and SDR content, but it can't quite cover the Adobe RGB color space properly if that's important to you for the, your content also, colours don't look quite as bright and vivid as they do on the QD OLED panels. LG Display have boosted the brightness of their panels this year though, offering a 1300 nits peak brightness for HDR. We'll do more brightness comparisons later in the year when we've had a chance to test and review some of these new screens. Let's take a quick look at the different QD OLED monitors being launched this year. Only a couple of the screens have full product pages so far, and so the others we don't have full information for at this time. So there are some gaps in this comparison, but this will hopefully give you a good summary of the features and extras on each screen that we know so far. And then you can decide from there which will suit your needs and have all the things that you want from a new monitor. We won't go through every detail and spec, but obviously feel free to pause the video if you need to absorb more of the information shown on the screen right here. But there are a few call outs to highlight for each. The Dell model is the first to market and it's the only curved model on this list. It's also got Dolby Vision HDR support and an HDMI 2.1 port that can handle eARC sound, which are features we've not seen available from the OLED monitors before. eARC sound seems to actually be exclusive to the Dell model so far at this time. 
Dell's warranty is also solid and specifically includes burning protection, which will give you some further reassurance. Although one of the key deciding factors here is probably whether you want a curved floor mat or not. It's a fairly subtle curve, at least at 1800R, but personally, we prefer a flat format in this size bracket. MSI's model could well be the next to market with the product page already live and some retailers having pre-order pages up already. This is a flat version and it's got an added USB Type-C connection with 90 watts power delivery and KVM support as well, which Dell's model doesn't have. They've also added a custom heatsink, which means that this model doesn't need any kind of active cooling fan like the Dell does, which might be important if you've got a quiet system. We expect the screen to be available around March time at the moment. The ASUS model was actually the first of all these screens to be announced, all the way back at Gamescom actually in August last year, when we saw it in action and we had a chance to have a look at it. They've had some delays with its launch, but they still list it as expected for Q1. The ASUS model also has USB-C and KVM support, and their model was also updated to include Dolby Vision support recently, which is good news, like on that Dell model. This one again doesn't need a cooling fan thanks to the added custom heatsink. ASUS's OLED screens have all been very solid performers to date, and although they usually carry a bit of a price premium, this one might well be worth hanging on to see how it performs, as it's bound to be one of the popular options. HP's model also has Dolby Vision support and a KVM function, as well as USB-C connection, which on their model supports a very high 140 watts power delivery, which some people might find useful. There is some confusion around whether this model will feature the latest DisplayPort 2.1 connection type, with it being mentioned on some pre-CES announcements and spec sheets, but oddly then being entirely left off their formal press release announcement later in the year. We've not been able to get any confirmation either from HP at this time, and given it was left off the press release, and at no point did they ever confirm whether this was even using any of the new UHBR speeds, we'll list this as TBC for now. If you've read our recent article, you'll know that DisplayPort 2.1 isn't actually really needed to power this spec anyway, and there are good reasons why it's not been widely adopted yet, so this isn't really a problem right now. Of other note for HP's model is a focus on the audio capabilities of the screen, with sound that has been tuned by HyperX and even some added 4x3 watt speakers. They haven't announced a date yet other than that it will be later this year, but we expect it to land in Q2 sometime. Gigabyte showcased their new screen at CES, although we've not been able to get much real information on this from them at this time. Of note for their FO32UP monitor, was the specifically listed inclusion of DisplayPort 2.1 connectivity with UHBR20 support, the full 80 gigs bandwidth potential of this new connection type. That's interesting in theory, although with very limited graphics card support and scalar support at the moment, it's unclear if this will mean other things are lacking or whether there may be later compatibility issues with input devices and graphics cards as they're developed and released. If nothing else, we do expect the reported inclusion of DisplayPort 2.1 to mean that this screen's release is delayed relative to the other monitors here, and will likely be in H2 at best this year, although Gigabyte haven't confirmed anything official yet. It looks like Gigabyte are also going to release another version of the screen, the FO32U2, which seems to be largely the same screen but without that DisplayPort 2.1 connection. If that's true, it's very likely that this would be released sooner. More info on both of these Gigabyte screens when we get it, of course. Samsung also announced their equivalent at CES this year. Of note with their screen is the pretty unusual choice to add an additional matte anti-glare coating to the panel themselves. And so their screen will be the only model here that has a different screen finish. That should handle reflections better, although it remains to be seen how it impacts picture quality in other ways. So we do look forward to testing and reviewing this screen later in the year, hopefully. Their model will also feature a range of smart TV functions like SmartThings Hub and their multi-control feature. We didn't really enjoy the user experience of the smart TV functions when we reviewed their 49-inch OLED G95SC last year, but let's hope some of that has been updated and improved for this new model. If you want or don't want those functions, then that's one area that will at least help narrow the choice down for you for sure. Samsung haven't given any indication of dates yet, but we'd expect it to be available around May time. Let's have a look at the other models then, which are built around LG Display's WOLED panel instead. 
the panel with that dual mode refresh rate feature and the inclusion of 1080p at 480Hz support. The ASUS model will be quite similar to their QD OLED monitor version in specs and features, except this version will have that dual mode refresh rate support, of course. There's USB-C again with 90 watts power delivery, fanless heatsink design and KVM support, but unlike their other model, this one doesn't have Dolby Vision HDR support, only normal HDR10. It does, however, feature an added ELMB blur reduction mode, otherwise known as BFI, which is expected to work at 120Hz at 4K, but could potentially work at 240Hz as well when using the 1080p resolution mode. Given the panel production isn't expected until around May-June, we wouldn't expect this to be available until around August-September time at best. The LG model is expected in a similar time scale, and notable differences are that their model will not feature USB-C connection, but it does have some advanced sound capabilities including their new DTS Virtual X certified Pixel Sound Audio, where the speakers are located behind the panel for supposedly more immersive sound. Some of the other features are not provided yet for their model. So there's all the currently announced 32 inch OLED monitors planned for this year. Hopefully that's given you a good summary of the key features and specs known so far, and you can try and narrow down which model might be right for you. We'll be providing updates on these models and reviewing some of them later this year as they're released. So do hit subscribe to make sure you stay up to date. If you want to know more about the OLED panel development plans for this year and next year, check out our LG Display W OLED and Samsung QD OLED videos linked below. There's loads of exciting news in there about other sizes, resolutions, and refresh rates. If you're after a different sized OLED screen, there were loads announced at this year's CES event, and you can check out our summary of all of that news in the video that's linked on the screen now. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time.